Let's talk some college football, shall we? With our favorite, Josh Pate of the Josh Pate College Football Show, the commissioner of the sport, at Josh Pate CFB on Twitter. You can catch his show live on YouTube every Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, 5 o'clock our time. Get the podcast wherever you find your podcasts. Uh, congratulations on 300,000 subscribers. That is awesome, Pate. Uh, I don't know what to call you today. Do I call you Group of Five, Pate? Do I call you soon-to-be Pac-12, Pate, because you're going to a Boise game? Do I call you Corporate, Pate? You're in New York. What do Ooh. I call you today? Yeah, well, the latter portion, I would just assume you not share. I don't want people to know I come up here. So let's go with uh, G5 Josh. I think that rolls off the tongue nicely. G5 Josh. Okay, I like that. Uh, I want to start somewhere where you ended your show last night and fired a lot of people up, and that is on – the nature of officiating in college football right now. Like, we went through this, you know, in Autzen a couple of weeks ago, a maybe interception on the opening drive, doesn't even get looked at, doesn't get reviewed. I think upon further evidence, it looked like it probably was a pick, but Ohio State goes on to score a touchdown on that opening drive, the 12-man penalty. It, this has been a debated thing. Last week, one of the more egregious decisions that I've ever seen was the overturn of the pass interference after throwing bottles on the field. I just, I'm curious for, to highlight to our listeners what you have talked about, what you have heard from officials, and how you think we can go about making this uh, a, a better system for fans everywhere. Yeah, so it's very important you just phrased it like that, a better system for fans everywhere. I think people get so insulated and so inside their bubble, they really forget what we're doing here. What we're doing is providing entertainment. It's not the football business. It's the entertainment business. Football is entertaining, so football is included in it. Um, that's why a whole lot more people watch football games than lacrosse because people care more about football than lacrosse. They're more entertained by it. So your entire existence, whether it be as a coach, as a player, or as an official at that scale is only made possible because a lot of fans have interest in what you do. So my simple theory here is those people who provide the very platform for you to professionally exist on in the first place deserve some kind of transparency about the process, about the mechanism. And as far as I can tell, if Dan Landing screws up, like if he goes for it on fourth down a bunch against Washington and it doesn't work, he's right there talking to the media 25 minutes later. If uh, Dylan Gabriel were to throw three interceptions against Illinois and they get upset and they lose, he's got to talk to the media. Officials, they, they do what they do. And I'm not suggesting they need to be perfect. I know none of us would be perfect calling a game. That's not my gripe. My gripe is they don't have to answer for it, and the league really never answers for it. They just give these explanations that have been good enough for way too long uh, because no one's ever really forced the issue on it. And they may or may not tell you two days later we messed up a call, and they may or may not tell you, yeah, it it went against you, and yeah, it probably cost you a game. Now we're not going (laughs) to overturn the game, so it doesn't really matter what we're talking about here. That stuff's not good enough. And so – You know, my argument has just been, how about a little transparency in the process? So I I said that on the, I said that on the Sunday show and an official came at me, not really aggressively, but he said, well, we do get analyzed. We do get graded. You know, we, we get criticized behind the scenes from our league offices. You just never see it. And I said, that's the problem. I never said you don't get analyzed. I said, we have no clue what's happening. And you're not a federal government employee. You're not working for NASA. You're not guarding nuclear codes. There does not need to be the kind of secrecy around the mechanisms of college football officiating and enforcement that there is. And if you built the sport today, it would never be built this way. The only reason it exists this way is because, number one, they've got that cop out of saying they're not full-time employees. They're just part-time. We'll make them full-time then (laughs) and nationalize the thing in the process so there's one standard. And number two, it, it wouldn't kill anyone to peel the curtain back a little bit and give explanation because as of now, You're never going to know what those officials were thinking when they overturned that call in the Texas game. You'll never know what the mechanisms of the process were in that Oregon-Ohio State game for why they didn't stop play and review that interception that wasn't. You just kind of got to eat it, and it should never be that way. So I I have a question about something that Dirt said on Monday's show that I want to ask you, but on this topic, because you you made me think a little bit here – I have thought about the the eye in the sky, the all-encompassing ref that's somewhere in a dark room de- deciding things in random moment. We have no explanation of when or why they decide to say this is confirmed or this has been overturned, right? There, there's no confirmation of that. And your clip went pretty viral on talking about this. What's the feedback you've gotten since you said this on the show? I don't know that I've ever had more coaches reach out for a singular clip 
from the show than that. I'm talking about, I mean, I don't know how many dozen of them. Uh, coordinators, ton of head coaches. But I had some officials reach out as well, and it's not the first time. I've had some officials reach out, and you'd think they'd be mad, but they're not. They, they'll reach out and they'll say, here's the problem from our end. We do not have, for lack of a better term, centralized enforcement. Uh, and what they mean by that is there's a way that they do things in the SEC, and it's different than the ACC, and it's different than Big 12. And then they, they lay out what it takes to be an official at that level and the clinics and the camps you have to go to. And they said, you wouldn't believe what kind of a joke some of these things are in that people are running the clinics who really aren't qualified to run them. And then they'll emphasize something at one that they de-emphasize at the other. And it takes doing that to play the game and elevate in that field. But then you elevate and you get to the biggest stage and you, you're really kind of operating on a foundation of jello because you really don't know what is and isn't supposed to be emphasized based on the conference patch on your uh, sleeve. And so the whole thing is a joke, and there's no excuse for it to be that way. And all the coaches reached out and said, thank you. We're, we're, not, we're not sitting here saying they need to be perfect. We'd just love some accountability because it's the only facet of our sport that's really important that there's no accountability and public transparency for. Yeah. Uh, Monday, Dirt said on the show, he only thinks four teams can win the national championship, Ohio State, Oregon, Georgia, and Texas. Uh, those teams have played each other. We have results from them. It's been a wild, fun, unpredictable season. Do you agree with that? Are there only four teams in Josh Pate's mind that can win the national championship? Now, that sounds like major P4 propaganda to me. And as G5 Josh, I can't stand for that. Hell what are yeah. you talking about? Uh, Fight for I the mean, Cougs. This is, this, is, uh, this might as well be profanity just sprayed all over the airwaves this morning. I think that I understand the logic. All right. Uh, but here's what I would say. Now, I'm, I'm not personally making this argument, but if I really wanted to be a thorn in the side this morning, I'd say, why Texas? Uh, Texas has had one test and they got – pushed around on their own field. So wh why not just three teams? What yeah. has Texas shown you? But I'm not, as I just said, this makes for the best content. I'm making an argument I myself am not making. That's always my back door that I build into anything I say. But I still think the field's a little bit larger than that, only because I think there may be one, two, three, however many teams that still have a little bit of scalability about themselves. I think about Tennessee, what would happen if their passing game clicked into place in November like it did the second half against Alabama? Because so they can run the ball, they play really good defense. I think about LSU. What happens if their ground game clicks into place like it did against Arkansas in November? Because they are a really good pressure team. Uh, they've got a quarterback that a lot of the NFL scouts love and Garrett Nussmeyer, and he's got a big test against A&M this weekend. I'm thinking about teams like that, um, and I'm thinking also – if I've seen vulnerability in all these big-time teams, and I have, then that means I cannot sit here before Halloween and draw a line on a piece of paper and say, all right, everyone below this line, you're out, and the champion will exclusively come from anywhere above this line. Or if I do that, I'm not, I'm not brave enough to do that. I've got to go way down the list, and I've got to have like 10 teams in it, and then I'll shave a few off as the weeks go by. But I think the field's still a little bit bigger than that. Yeah, it's very anti-2007 to me. I will acknowledge that. I'm not happy with the take that I had on Monday, but we'll see how this uh, how the season unfolds. Josh Pate is our guest, the commissioner of college football. You can catch his show every Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, live on YouTube, 5 o'clock our time, podcast, wherever you find your podcast, at Josh Pate CFB on Twitter. Illinois is coming to town this weekend, a game that I will acknowledge to you at the start of the year. I looked at, hey, you know, Illinois, whatever. We weren't excited for Let's be honest. You know, hey, we weren't. Play Bielema on a Rose Bowl many moons ago, so I guess that's kind of interesting. Now they're a one-loss team. They're coming off a win over Michigan. Uh, an interesting matchup. All of a sudden, another ranked game that's happening, and Oregon gets the CBS music, which is just going to blow my mind hearing that and watching the game back this weekend to hear that SEC theme song playing for an Oregon-Illinois game. Uh, your thoughts on that matchup and, and the, the pucker factor for the Ducks this weekend with the top 20 team coming to town? I think the opposite of the way most people look at these kind of games. So you said it right. You said in the preseason this was a game you just kind of put a pencil W next to, and now all of a sudden the team comes in their rank. I think that's a blessing because the team is what the team is. Like They've got the players they've got. They've got the staff they've got. If they can win some games early and be ranked when they come into your building and you get the national 330 uh, Eastern, 1230 Pacific window, to me that's a blessing because you – you don't have to worry about the moment having your guy at attention. Now, I thought Oregon, what they did at Purdue last Friday night 
was really impressive. No one cares about it because Purdue's terrible. But to go on the road and have that level of focus, six days rest off an Ohio State win, uh, two time zones away, I don't take that for granted. So I don't think that having Oregon's attention is necessarily a problem that was going to be present with the Illinois game. Uh, the one thing I'll watch is Illinois can get really physical with you. Like, they don't back away from that. That is their M.O. That, that's the team they are. And then the other thing is, they found a couple of different ways to win games. They had to hang half a hundred to beat Purdue, and then they held Michigan to seven last week, won, won a different style game. So they've won the, the slingshot. They've won the rock fight. They, they're comfortable, I think, playing any, any style. But if Oregon gets an early lead on them, Oregon should slam the door in their face. It's that simple uh, and that difficult. I'll have my eye on it. You know, as a CBS employee, I am contractually <laughs> mandated to watch the game. But even if I didn't, I would, I'd have my eye on it. I was going to ask you after the game ended on Saturday between Bama and Tennessee, like thoughts on Bama, but I kind of got it this week on fine bomb. So I won't actually ask you that because you're very familiar with those people. I you've made me pivot. I you're going to a G five game. This is a very interesting one. We just watched UNLV down in Corvallis. We've watched Boise in Eugene and throughout this year, Ashton Jainty having an amazing season. Feels like he might be the Heisman trophy winner. Uh, at the minimum, he's a finalist. Kind of just your thoughts, like if Boise can win this, are we looking at a scenario, Josh, where a G5 team gets a top four seed in your mind, or is that eliminated? Is that gone since both these teams have lost? I think it's eliminated because they've lost, but like we just said a little while ago, you have to wait and see how the rest of the field plays out. None of this, none of these statements can be made in a vacuum at any point, much less in October. So... I mean, let's just let the dice land how they land. But, I, you know, the way I look at this game, uh, and we're talking Boise UNLV here, I look at it as sort of forget about the postseason implications for a second and just appreciate it's a really big-time college football game here. It's not a big G5 game. It's just a big game. And then you've got the subtext, of course, of Aston Genty, and everyone should be tuned in to watch him. Uh, I'm, I'm going in person because I haven't been able to watch him in person yet. But also – Taj Malik Williams coming in at quarterback after their quarterback quit, whatever you think about that, uh, that's what happened, uh, is one of the hidden stories of college football this year. Think about how many Power Four teams couldn't withstand that. Yeah. And you got UNLV down there. If anything, guys, they've, they've gotten better since their starting quarterback walked out the door. And Taj Malik Williams is, is the guy who came in, and he had some experience, so it wasn't like he was just a total foreign concept or anything. But – I Man, what Barry Odom's doing down there, and for them to draw Boise and both of them be on the national radar, uh, I'm glad that's on a Friday night so I can get out there. I, I cannot wait to see that. And I also, granted, I've never taken in a UNLV game. I've been in that building for the Pac-12 title game. I mean, wouldn't wouldn't I be correct in assuming we'll have a pretty pretty lively environment there Friday night? Yeah, I'm, I would think so. I Boise think fans so. probably pretty. Boise fans down there. going down. It's a fun yeah. trip for fan bases to go. There's no doubt about that. We'll let you go on this one, G5 Josh. Are are we just doing like corporate meetings in New York? Are we going to see you and are we going to see suit and tie, Josh, on television? What are we doing in New York City? Mm. It's terrible. I'll look like I'm applying for a loan. I got to put on the suit. <laughs> I got to go. I don't have to. I get to go on Inside College Football tonight on uh, CBS Sports Network. But I just want you guys, when you see me, don't remember me this way. <laughs> <laughs> well, always remember Black T and White T, Josh. Always. He's the commissioner of the sport. Check the show every Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, 5 o'clock our time, live on YouTube, podcast, wherever you find your podcast, Josh Pate's College Football Show, at Josh Pate CFB. Congrats again on 300,000 subs. Always enjoy the time, and we'll chat again next week. I appreciate it, guys. There you go. Josh Pate, live from New York City. G5 Josh, really cool. He's going to the UNLV Boise game on Friday, and then he's turning around and going to his backyard because he lives in Nashville. And uh, Texas is in town playing Vanderbilt this weekend. Yeah, the only game I didn't get to ask about there, because the officiating thing is interesting to me, yeah. and, and how they're deciding when to change calls and how to change calls and when to not do it. 
it's a whole fascinating aspect, I think, of the sport. I'm I'm with him 100%. We just need transparency, man. Just explain it. What were you thinking? Why was yeah. that conversation had? Don't release a statement as a conference 48 hours later saying we should have, you know, this is what we thought. Do you get tra- I, see, that's the thing is, you're, you're right, but, like, even in the NBA, when you do get to interview a ref, you get one question from one media That's member. what I'm yeah. saying. It should be more than that. Yeah, you no should have to go sit at a podium after yeah. the game and say, answer questions. Why didn't you review that? Why did you overturn the call? Like, why are they not held to that standard? Yeah. You're human. You're going to make mistakes. Like, I, we all get it. I'm not expecting you to be perfect. I had this feeling watching the Lynx and Liberty. I said, Please yes. explain that call to give yes. Stewart two free throws. It was a horrible call. It was horrific. Uh, I wanted to ask about Indiana Washington. Yeah. But if Indiana wins, even with a backup. They got Ohio State the week after that. It's a big game for the Huskies. But if Indiana does win... I, I think there's something we need to bring up next week with him. Okay. Uh, Especially I'm, how much you hate him. Yeah, well, I'm anti-Indiana on this show. He did go through on his show last night the chaos factor in all these conferences. It is start. It's funny. It's looming to, again. Looming again because we no longer have divisions. And there's like there's a bunch of teams who don't play each other who are all in the mix to win. If we're going to have tiebreakers deciding who plays in conference champion. Like it, the chaos will ensue. There is a world and a scenario where we have an undefeated um, – what, what, what was the scenario? There's, like, undefeated teams who don't make conference title games because of tiebreakers. Well, if you look at the Big Ten right now, it's probably not going to happen. Oregon, Penn State, and Indiana are the three undefeated teams in the Big Ten. They don't play each other. Hmm. So if they all win out, you would they would all be undefeated. What is that tiebreaker? I think it's uh, – there's a whole list of them. How but like, it's just wild it's, that that's yeah, a scenario. Common opponent, right, you right. know, point differential. Probably I, you know, something, something like yeah. that. But uh, right. good luck, you know – Selling that to a fan base who gets left out of the Big Ten title game because they were also undefeated. Is Notre Dame so. eliminated if they lose to Navy this weekend? Two no. lost Notre Dame because we said that would get in before the year, but now yes. it's like the A and M win looks better and better every single week. A and M plays LSU this week if A and M wins. Yeah, but a loss to Navy in Northern Illinois is that's undefeated rank Navy to you. And I think Northern Illinois is having a nice little. Northern season Illinois is not bad, man. They're not bad. They're still atop the MAC. That's Are a they? fun little game uh, this they, weekend. They're four and three, actually. Yeah. All right, well, they're one and two in their conference. Spoke play. too soon there.